Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. So many of you have emailed asking questions about this student loan business that we kind of have to do it. So curses on all of you and Ant. What's new and exciting in your world this week to the extent that it is defined by the student loan fiasco? Listener Jessica Carmen wrote asking, can you please talk about Biden's plan to forgive student loans? What is your take on the loan forgiveness and repercussions on inflation? I don't want to disrespect Jessica here, but I got at least 30 emails on this topic. I did too, although most of them were on the economics. Jessica goes further and asks a question on the politics side. She says, I'm also confused as to how the president has the authority to do this. I can answer that in two easy seconds. It's part and parcel of an emergency power that the president was using during covid Oh, really? First, they had to contend that student loans are some kind of emergent catastrophe. This would never survive muster at the Supreme Court. Never. Well, that's interesting. Do I take from that that we can expect no more of this next year, year after? No, I think you can take from that that you'll get nothing but this next year and the year after. Once they've found a way to abuse their authority, they keep right on abusing it. So there's no deadline on the emergency powers? Of course not. There never is. You just keep going until Congress tells you to stop. That's like asking if there's a deadline on the Commerce Clause. Right? Right. Of course there's that. I have encountered a tremendous amount of not just misunderstanding about the economics of the student loan plan, but apparently a tremendous amount of misunderstanding about how loans in general work. I've seen arguments that student loan forgiveness doesn't cost taxpayers anything because the money's already spent. That's incorrect. Suppose a student was supposed to pay back $10,000 five years from now, and the government has just forgiven the loan. Five years from now, Congress will have $10,000 less revenue than it otherwise would have to do whatever it does with it, to spend on other things or to help to balance the budget or whatever it is. (laughs) To help balance the budget? Are you serious? (laughs) Well, the point is... (laughs) What the f*** is wrong with you? The government would have this money, and now it's not going to have it because the students are not going to be paying it back. And that means that the rest of us either will receive $10,000 less in government services than we would have otherwise, or we'll pay $10,000 more in taxes than we would have otherwise, or we'll endure $10,000 more worth of inflation than we would have otherwise. No matter how you slice it, the government hasn't forgiven loans. It has instead removed the burden from the shoulders of the students and put it squarely on the shoulders of the rest of us. The argument that forgiving student loans is a good and moral thing similarly has no legs. The student who has his loan forgiven will end up paying back some of that forgiveness later in the form of higher taxes, but he'll only end up paying back some. Some will be paid by people who have already paid for their own student loans and now have to also pay for this person's student loans, and some will be paid by people who didn't go to college at all. Forgiving student loans doesn't cause inflation, but the manner in which the forgiveness is financed can cause inflation. Remember, forgiveness means the government will be collecting less money in the future from borrowers. If Congress doesn't cut spending to match the money that it won't be collecting, and if it doesn't raise taxes to compensate for the money that it won't be collecting, then it will have to print money to compensate, and that causes inflation. Now, an astute listener may say that there's a fourth option, that's borrowing the money, but government borrowing money is the same as raising taxes— Rather than having to raise taxes by a large amount in one year, when the government borrows, it instead has to raise taxes in small amounts over many years to pay the interest on the loan. Contrary to what detractors say, loan forgiveness is not a bank bailout. The Affordable Care Act authorized the Department of Education to lend directly to students— You heard that right. This was the Affordable Care Act that upended our health care system. There was a portion of it that was dedicated to student loans in which it set up the Department of Education to lend directly. Consequently, today, the Department of Education holds more than 90 percent of student loan debt. Student loan forgiveness applies only to this government held debt, not to debt held by private banks. 
Proponents say that student loan forgiveness will be good for the economy because it gives students the financial freedom to invest in starting businesses, to buy houses and cars, and that this stimulates the economy. All of this is true, but it's only half the truth. For every additional dollar students will be able to spend because their loans are forgiven, the rest of us will have one dollar less to spend because we must pay for the forgiven loans. In the end, there's no positive economic effect. All the forgiveness does is to shift spending away from the general population towards students. Now, relatively speaking, the current round of loan forgiveness isn't that big of a deal. When you're running trillion-dollar deficits, another $50 billion is pocket change. What worries me is what comes next. Next year's students will understandably want loan forgiveness also. Tuition will rise because it can. Universities don't have to worry about students shying away from high-priced schools because the students aren't paying the bill. As tuition rises, there will be a call for even more loan forgiveness. Then there will be an influx of students into colleges and universities who are looking for a four-year all-expenses-paid vacation. This increase in demand for higher education will push tuition up even further. And what will these vacationing students study? On average, they'll want to study easy subjects. And so demand for majors like gender studies and child and family education will skyrocket. When these students hit the job market and can't find jobs in their fields, politicians will hold hearings asking why higher education is costing taxpayers so much and delivering so little. Politicians will then say that since the government is paying for higher education, it should have a say in what's going on in higher education. And there we have public schools 2.0. All the problems that government has come to bring to public education, it will now also bring to higher education. In the end, a college degree is either valuable or it isn't. If it's valuable, it will pay for itself. If it's not valuable, no one should pay for it. Either way, there's no reason for government to be involved in higher education. The more involved it does get, the worse the problem becomes. People don't want to hear this. College just became more expensive. This free thing is going to make college more expensive. And the students won't care because they're not paying well, why would it. they care? You want to track the beginning of the expensive time for education? Start with college loans because that's what did it. People have also said to me, in support of forgiving student loans, that when people are better educated, they're better able to contribute to society, they're more productive, and that's a good thing. That comes back to the rest of us in the form of better services, more products, lower prices because of all this education people are getting. That statement glosses over completely the question of what is the student studying. If you study gender studies, you're not going to be contributing to finding some new cure for cancer. But nonetheless, my comeback to that is you reward the person for their contribution to society when you purchase their product. So if I go get an education that enables me to build computers and I sell computers to you and you pay me for these computers, you're paying me for the computers, is your compensating me for that education? Now, here's the important question. What happens if you're paying me for these computers I build isn't enough for me to repay my student loans? Well, what that tells me is that I shouldn't have gone into computers. There are so many people building computers that the price is so low that we don't need any more of them. I should have gone into something else. The ability to pay back your student loan becomes a signal to all of us as to how we should best use society's resources. So if you major in medieval poetry, there might not be a market for you. Right. You might have made a mistake. You went out of your way to major in something nobody else valued. Let me say something in defense of medieval poetry, and that is the student could say, this thing makes me a better person. Maybe it doesn't have any great market value, but it makes me a better person. To which I say, that's fine, but it makes you a better person. It's not contributing anything to society. How do I know? Because the contribution to society is reflected in what people will pay you to do with that education. And there's a very dangerous path. We might be telling people what they will major in if we're going to pay for it. Yep. 
That makes me very nervous. The next step is for politicians to take a hand in what's going on on college campuses in terms of education because, well, they're footing the bill. You want an example of this? Look at health care. The government started taking a heavier hand in paying for health care, for health insurance, and what happens? Now we have all kinds of government regulations about what health care should and should not provide and who can and cannot provide it. Look for the same thing in higher ed. I'm going to keep this brief given how long we just took on yours. I'm going to refer back to Reason Magazine twice over. There's this fantastic headline on Reason right now. Americans view marijuana much more favorably than alcohol. And I've been saying this for years, that sooner or later, when all the potheads came out into public, exactly no one would be shocked by anything they do. And I remember in Colorado, when this train first started chugging along, all of the commentators, those who know better, they explained to us why their world would fall apart because of violent crime that potheads would now. Who, what pothead in the world ever did any violent crime? That's the Jack Daniels people, not the marijuana people. And finally, we see some begrudging acknowledgement that this is actually how it went. But if you really want to be a friend to the potheads, wander around with one of those big bins filled with potato chips. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> just just kind of hand them on out. Everybody's going to be happy. But isn't that nice that we're finally seeing some kind of data that's emerging saying, yeah, th this turned out to be no big deal at all. As a matter of fact, we trust this product more than we trust alcohol. And I want to know, where are the politicians with the mea culpas saying, we are so sorry, we got it wrong, we jailed millions of people, we ruined their lives, and there was no need for doing that. We're not even going to get apologies from the politicians who said we were entering into a hellscape five years ago, yep. let alone 30 years ago, right? All these people who had their lives more or less ruined by ridiculous laws that were unevenly applied. And look at the asymmetry here. If a corporation had ruined millions of people's lives like that, people would be calling for heads. Oh, that corporation would be out of business. Yeah, and yet the government can do it and we just shrug and move on. Yeah, that's right. Well, they surely meant the best. You know, they well, meant the well. best, right. We have to get to the foolishness of the week, Ant. In order to do this, I have to tell you something that you don't know and something that we both should have known but didn't. Did you know there is an annual conference for podcasters? I discovered that just today. Podcast Movement. Yeah. How they arrived at that name, I will never know. Podcast Movement had a booth which the Daily Wire sat behind. And anybody who's done anything like we do for a living, you know that booth work is really not the greatest thing in the world, right? You have yeah. to sit there and answer lots of questions, and it's a living hell for introverts. Ben Shapiro is somehow involved. I think he helped found the Daily Wire. He drifted into Podcast Movement, this conference that we're talking about, took a couple of selfies with people, right? They wanted to get a picture with him, and he had a couple of sentences here and a couple of sentences there, and he turned around and left, only to find that the people who ran this event apologized for, quote, the harm done by Ben Shapiro's <laughs> presence. The harm done. you got to be kidding me. I'm not a big fan of Ben Shapiro. I don't think he's all that great. I also don't think he's all that horrible either. I tend to ignore what he does, and I'm pretty sure he doesn't pay a lot of attention to what we do. But if you think that one human being walking into your midst, shaking some hands, taking some photos and leaving is somehow harm, then you have no idea what harm even is. I don't know how we ended up raising a bunch of people who are so soft that they think this is harm. Well, it's funny you say this because I ran across the article and I didn't know there was such a thing as a podcast conference. And my first reaction was, oh, Caught we, me have, by surprise too. Yeah, we have to go do that and have a booth there. Until I read about the Ben Shapiro business, I thought there is no way I'm getting anywhere near that group. But the larger point remains, right? How did we raise a generation, maybe even two, that think this is what harm is? Last week, we had a first. We gave away a mug. I'm very happy to say that James was inundated with email that annoyed him to no end. So I want to do it again. Send your emails. First one that comes in with the subject, mug me, gets a mug. Oh, here we go. Here we <laughs> fucking go. 
And just to keep my inbox somehow clean from what's about to happen, if you're not sending your email at about one minute after noon Eastern time on Wednesday, you haven't won. And filling my inbox with hundreds of messages, you got to stop. It makes me happy. (laughs) Every time my email pings, I know that James' blood pressure just went up a little bit. (laughs) And this is how we know that Ant is an idiot. (laughs) Idiot. To get more Ant and James, buy a copy of our excellent book, Cooperation and Coercion. You can find the paper and electronic versions on Amazon and the audio version on Audible. If you'd like to support Words and Numbers, make your way over to patreon.com slash wordsandnumbers, where you can contribute to our podcast-making habits. If you'd like to schedule us to come speak at your event, be it corporate or educational, or have James officiate at your wedding Send us an email at wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. So, Ant, you may find this hard to believe, but we political scientists think about some things that you economists don't, or at least we think about them a little bit differently. We're social scientists, but there's no way that we can study human beings and come up with definitive answers regarding how they're going to behave, because human beings lie all the time. Years back, I went and looked up what the psychologists had on the matter, and the few studies that I was able to find indicated that people lie so much that they lie to total strangers within 30 seconds of meeting them. Oh, yeah, and this is pervasive throughout any discipline that touches on human beings. I do a lot of research in consumer psychology, and the same problem there. If you ask them questions, they'll give you answers that aren't necessarily correct. They're trying to portray themselves a certain way. In fact, in economics, we have a name for this. We call it revealed preference. That is, revealing what you prefer by your actions. So, for example, you'll have people say things like, yeah, we should all be driving electric cars, and yet they go and buy gasoline-powered cars. Revealed preference says they actually don't believe what they just said. The the lying is more meaningful than that, because you can take a look at what people do and say, okay, well, there's your preference. But what about on all those things that you can't really check? And there's some interesting things there. In consumer psychology, one of the things we do, rather than asking subjects, for example, how do you feel? Are you happy? Are you sad? This kind of thing. We ask, how do the people around you feel? invariably what happens is the person projects whatever his own psyche is onto those around him, and you end up getting a more truthful response. That's just one way that psychologists use to tease out the truth. And you put me on to this article that we're going to talk about here in a minute. And what it does is it teases out what people say they believe from what they actually believe. The way they do it is by using something called item count analysis. And item count analysis, it's this beautiful thing. I want to get people's opinions on controversial things, like, for example, parents should have more influence over public school education. You'll have a tendency to answer that question the way you think people expect you to answer it, rather than the way you actually believe. Stop right there for a second. A bunch of years ago, when you and I were probably both at least close to being undergraduates, this is the politically correct movement. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When the unwashed masses were informed that they were never to admit to certain of their long-held beliefs, their preferences, however you want to put that. Instead, what they were told was that there were answers to these questions. There were right answers. That's right. There were correct answers, and thus those answers were politically correct. That lasted a lot longer than people think, and you could make, I think, a very pressing case that it never disappeared from college campuses. It just cycled through 30 years later and became this thing called wokeism. I don't think it's even disappeared from regular adults who are out of college. Maybe not. And by the time you start thinking about these things, well, all right, is there a face we could put on it with people lying and the whatnot? And I think there is. Because political science, it's got to be good for something. And I remember once upon a time looking into the candidacy of David Duke for multiple political offices. For those who don't know, Duke was either a current or a former Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. And he didn't deny it, as I recall. Well, he was a little slippery about whether he was still that or not. And after a while, he said, no, 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 I do hereby renounce my racism and I'm a born-again Christian, blah, 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 blah. 
And then after he didn't win office for a while, he seemed to revert, which leads me to believe he had never actually walked away from his racist past in the first place. But here's the interesting part. Every office he ran for, he received more of the vote than he should have given pre-election polling. So when the pollsters got in touch with people in the various districts he was running, or in some cases, the state of Louisiana and others, the Democratic Party, where he ran for the nomination for president back in 88, more people voted for him than would have admitted to it on a telephone interview with a pollster. Yeah, and I think the same phenomenon occurred with Trump's first election. It came out of left field in the sense that a lot of people intended to vote for him, but wouldn't admit that. Maybe. I'm not willing to go that far yet. The David Duke problem is, I think, perfectly explanatory. People will give you the answer that they think you want instead of the answer that they know to be correct. Yeah, and part of that motivation is to please the other person. Sure. Now, if it's an anonymous pollster, that doesn't hold much water. But part of it as well, how should I say, it's a sense of feeling like you're part of the larger group. If I think the larger group believes X, I'm going to report that I believe it too, because I'm one of them. In the case of David Duke, people didn't want other people to think they're racist. Without question, they were racist, because who am I never going to vote for? Anybody who was in the Klan. Mm -hmm. That's not a difficult thing for me to say. And yet a bunch of people said it and then turned right around and voted for David Duke anyway. But notice what happened there. In that example you could compare what people said they were going to do to what they actually did. And we could see their vote. That's what we call revealed preference. But what do you do when there is nothing to observe in terms of revealed preference? It's just your opinion. That's right. There is no vote being taken. So what happens here is the researchers use this technique called item count. The way this works is you take a group of people and you present them with several statements. I'll give you some examples. Parents should have more influence over public school. Mental illness can be overcome with willpower. The U.S. should completely phase out fossil fuels. So I'll give you those three statements. I ask you, how many of those statements do you agree with? Don't tell me which ones you agree with. Just tell me how many of them you agree with. So you've got some protection here because you're not going to tell me exactly which ones. I give those three questions to one set of people. To another set of people, I give the same three questions with an additional fourth, the internet should be a free speech zone. And I ask you, how many of those do you agree with? Now, if I see a difference in the numbers, the people over here on the left said they agree with 2.5 of them on average, and the people on the right said they agree with 3.5 on, on average, I know what just happened. The people actually agree with that additional statement, the internet should be a free speech zone, because that was the difference in the two groups. This is the thing the researchers have done, is to present different groups of people with different sets of questions and ask how many of these things do you agree with? And by comparing this, they can get a handle on what people are actually believing as opposed to what they're saying they believe. And this brings us directly to that very interesting batch of questions that were asked of any number of people. This is a current set of questions. So we actually know, within broad parameters, what people think. We do. And here's the thing before we go into the specific questions. The researchers note here that everybody, and by everybody I mean the ways that they split the people apart demographically. They split them by race. They split them by political affiliation. They split them by age. They split them by gender. No matter how the researchers split the people, they found this same phenomenon repeated again and again. So it's not like the Democrats are subject to this phenomenon, but the Republicans aren't. No, everybody is. It doesn't matter how you slice the pie. All right. What have we learned? Well, some interesting things. For example, this question about mask wearing, is it effective? And you ask people, if you ask them publicly, 59% of them will say, yes, mask wearing is effective. But when you apply this analytic technique and you dig into what they actually believe, you find out that only 47% believe it was effective. So you go from almost 60% down to less than half. Still, so that's not a gigantic difference, right? Well, the question that comes is, are there any gigantic differences or are we maybe what I would call all differences within the family where there are differences, but they're not overwhelming? You start to see the larger differences when you break down by group. 
for example, if you look at the age group 30 to 44, so roughly speaking, people who would be old enough to have kids in the public school system, and you ask them, should parents have more say in education? Publicly, 48% of them say yes. Parents should have a greater say in public education. Privately, 74%. It goes from less than half of them saying, yeah, we should have more control over public education to almost three quarters of them saying we should have more control over public education. That's actually quite a meaningful difference. Isn't that fascinating? Okay, I know why people lie when we ask, did you vote for David Duke? Control or a say in public education? These seem to me to be unremarkable things. You would think so, but you can imagine all the baggage that goes with a statement like that. If people know that I believe that parents should have a greater say in public education, they can attach to me all sorts of things like, well, this guy might be a crazy person or this guy hates teachers or he's against teacher unions or all sorts of things that I may not want attached to me publicly. So you just say what you say to get away from whatever you need to get away from. Right, to get along. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking about woke mobs yet again. Yeah. Where somebody said something 35 years ago in a drastically different context, when different mores were in control of our behavior, and we're going to hold him to account so badly that he'll never work again. Yeah. To me, this just seems cruel. But if you know that that's what's going to happen, you're going to shut your mouth. Yeah. Now, you might have done something untoward 35 years ago, but you're not an idiot today. Another example along those lines, when you ask men, is the question of abortion a question between the woman and her doctor? You ask them publicly, 60% of them will say, yes, this is a question that should be addressed between the woman and her doctor. But you ask them privately, only 45% say yes. And it's exactly that. You don't want to be called a misogynist or have people say that you've got no right to have an opinion on this matter, so you just get along. But it's pretty clear what happens here. The men think, okay, what happens if I get a woman pregnant? Do I have any say in the matter? And that first answer says, no, you don't. The answer you don't give says, of course you do. Yeah. There's a couple of interesting things that I'm still scratching my head about. I think you're going to enjoy this. Here's the question. Should CEOs take a public stand on social issues? If you split the respondents down by Republican Democrat, should CEOs take a public stand on social issues? Publicly, 13% of Republicans say yes, 44% of Democrats say yes. Yep, that's about what I would expect. Which is what we would kind of expect. But here's where it gets really strange. When asked privately, so no one's going to know how you answer this question, but again, we put the question to you, should CEOs take a public stand on social issues? Privately, 20% of Republicans say yes, 11% of Democrats. Huh? Isn't that it something? It flips. Yeah. <laughs> the public that's persona a, is the opposite of the private persona. That's, a, that's the strangest thing. That's hilarious. Isn't it? There's significant disagreement, Democrats to Republicans, but it flips. <laughs> they disagree one way publicly and the opposite way privately. My knee-jerk reaction is, what the hell's wrong with you people? But that's <laughs> right, almost yeah. always my knee-jerk reaction. I think in a lot of cases like this, and you have to be careful. I'm not poking at this study because I haven't read it that carefully. But you do have to be careful about questions like this because if you ask up front, do you identify Democrat, do you identify Republican? In answering that question, you create a bias in the respondent's head. And my tendency is thereafter to answer the rest of your questions more in line with what I perceive to be my party's take on the question. The right way to do this is you ask political affiliation at the very end after you've asked all of these questions. I think what we're seeing here is fascinating, but not terribly unexpected if you think it through. We're seeing the American people doing their best not to put their own heads on a chopping block. Right, yeah. They don't even want the trappings of that. Even if it's anonymous, they don't want to answer in a way that would cause them personal grief were it to be public. And then second, I think the American people try very hard not to give offense. Yeah. They're fundamentally decent. They don't want to yell and scream at each other. Now, a small subset does, and that's what we see on the news every night. 
But when you walk through your neighborhood, are you screaming and yelling at your neighbors as you do it? Almost no one would answer yes to that question. Right. Well, we remember our grandmothers saying, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything. Well, that's not what my grandmother said. She said, shut the <laughs> f*** up. <laughs> but I guess... She was talking to you, James. <laughs> I had a different kind of grandmother than you had. But I'll tell you this, as I walk through my neighborhood, the thing you're supposed to do here is wave at each other. Right. I don't get this. It took me probably a year before I would comply. But you're supposed to wave at each other as you pass each other in this neighborhood. I don't know why. I mean, I think it's because people want to maintain some sort of neighborhood status. For me, it's just a bunch of people living in close proximity. We used to do that in West Virginia. Well, I'm sure they still do. You pass somebody on the back roads and you wave. You have no idea. You may never see the guy ever again, but that's just what you do. You just wave. You acknowledge that they're there. Where you lived, waving was probably a way of saying, I'm driving by. Is your life in danger? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Because you might not have seen another person for the rest of that day. Right. Here, we're five minutes away by car, probably three to the nearest grocery store. There's really no problem here. But you started this conversation referencing lying, and it's something that we attach negative connotation to. And yet, I've heard psychologists, and to the extent that I can understand what they're saying, I tend to agree. I've heard psychologists say that lying is actually a form of social lubrication. That, look, we're not all going to agree on everything, but you lie just to get along, to reduce friction between you and the next guy. And that's how we help society move along. I have different thoughts on the matter, but those are perfectly reasonable thoughts, too. <laughs> you just like disagreeing with people. <laughs> look, I think people lie all the time. I just think it's not really a form of social lubrication in most cases. Hmm. It's just what people do. And I'm happy enough to know that without knowing why, at least not knowing why definitively. Because really what matters, understanding what people do or knowing that they'll do what they do. And it's that second thing every time. I want to study human beings and know what they will do next. You have to admit that you're not going to ever be that successful. But you can inch toward it. And I understand better today what people will do than I did 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I've learned something. Let me give one more question from this survey that I found interesting. Here's the statement. Colleges should prohibit offensive speech. So to what extent do you agree with this? When asked in a public venue, that is, the respondent knows that others are going to know how he responded, 14% of Republicans agree with the statement. Colleges should prohibit offensive speech. 27% of Democrats agree with the statement. The numbers kind of go according to conventional wisdom. The Democrats are more apt to say, yeah, colleges should prohibit offensive speech, Republicans less so. Although, honestly, I was surprised that either of those numbers were as low as they are, but there they are. 14% Republicans, 27% Democrats. But here's the thing. When asked privately, so they're asked under these conditions that no one's going to know what their answer is, colleges should prohibit offensive speech. 20% of Republicans agree. 13% of Democrats agree. You got to be shitting me. Again, it flips. Yeah. The weirdest thing. We're going to have to do some follow up on this. I don't see a way around it. This is just to underline. This is one study, and I'm sure there'll be follow up studies by other researchers. When you're dealing with human beings in the best of times, there are all sorts of things that can go wrong in a survey like this. Yep. But the preliminary results here certainly do give you food for thought. We started our conversation oddly before we turn the microphones on, we do this from time to time, by remembering that familial admonition where you were told as a boy that wherever you happen to be, don't talk about religion or politics. Right. Which I've come to realize is very solid advice. We don't need to have a fight every year at Thanksgiving. We need to have turkey and football. <laughs> right. Don't have to have a fight. I'm happy with detente for Thanksgiving. You shut up, I'll shut up, we'll have a lovely time. We get back to hating each other tomorrow. You know, there's certain wisdom in that. Particularly when neither one of you is going to change the other one's mind. So what is the point of having the conversation? It's just grandstanding from minute one. But honestly, when somebody starts, I'll jump right in. I'm not going to let it slide. Right. So the best thing is for us to know that and not let it start in the first place. And yet when we decide we're not going to talk about religion or politics... We come to misunderstand each other quite a lot hmm. because 
I should be talking to people about politics. I'm still going to leave religion out of the mix. I think there's a hierarchy here. Yeah. The worst solution is that you argue to no end. The better solution is you just stay off the topic. I think there's a better one still, and it's rare, but you do find people who can do this, and you find a lot of them on Words and Numbers backstage on Facebook, and that is people who can disagree civilly. We used to be much better at this than we presently are. I can't help but think that the intervening variable of internet communication is the culprit here. It's the one thing that's changed from then to now. Mm -hmm. 30, 40 years ago, when we would all sit down to dinner, you knew that if you said something horrible, you were going to be a pariah at the only group of people who would let you in in the first place. Right, yeah. And we didn't learn how to be shrill by talking to strangers behind screen names. In a discussion like this, you're not going to change the other person's mind. And I think in a civil discussion, you're not going to change the other person's mind either. But something important does happen, and that's... I get to understand you better and you get to understand me better. And that reduces what I see on social media. It reduces the hatred of the two groups. It's like road rage. You don't see the other human being. All you see are characters on a screen or a car on the road. And what do we get now? We get predictions of American Civil War. And who are going to be the respective armies in this coming war? A bunch of pencil neck Democrats who couldn't pull a trigger or beat up a person if they had to, and a bunch of Republicans who are at least 50 years past it. These are the two groups that we're worried about engaging in civil war at this point. Do we have some political violence? Yeah, we do, actually. A little more lately than I'm comfortable with. Is this going to lead to a civil war? Don't be ridiculous. But in the meantime, we're missing an opportunity to understand each other better. Who does think it's going to lead to civil war? The far right and the far left on both sides of the coin. Yeah, the extremists. They can't manage to even say hello to somebody without being offended. Living in this country, we have the absolute best of everything. We are so blessed that people can't even fathom how at least half the globe lives. And when I hear people saying, well, you know, it's these terrible Trump people or it's these pinko Democrats, you got to be kidding me. These are not reasonable thoughts. Being intelligent means you can look at a situation and diagnose it quickly and correctly. Neither of these groups is doing any of that. And that's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Until next time, be sure to follow us on Twitter. Handles are in the show notes. Join Words and Numbers Backstage, the Facebook group where the conversation continues, and send us email, wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. Until next week, try to be nice to one person. One person who doesn't deserve it. Just one. And who knows, it may turn into a trend. Give it a shot. You might feel good about yourself. You could say you tried. You tried, that's right. Till next week, can't take it easy. See you next week, James. 